Thank you, Linda. So these convenings are a good time to remember our leaders, the NCTM presidents who really gave us as an organization our North Star. It's a special privilege to give the RSM Carl Equity Lecture. I met Iris, I guess, in the mid-80s, uh, when she was the founding member of the board of the Math Science Education Board of the National Research Council. And looking out at the crowd and your ages, I can see that relatively few of you got to work with the small, wiry, fierce Iris Carl. She was an awesome character, and she was of that generation of NCTM presidents, along with Glenda Lappin, Lee Stiff, and others, Gail Burrell, who forged the first clear statement of NCTM's commitment to rich mathematics education for all students. She was a mentor, a lifelong mentor to Kathy Seely, who along with Susan Hull and me has been at the Dana Center for 20 years. So being that Kathy has mentored me, and another great NCTM president, I feel like a grandchild of Iris Carl. Um, she passed in 2004, and as we say, may her memory be a blessing. She was a great, great leader. So, it's my hope in this talk first to give you some perspective on the tectonic plate shifts reshaping our profession and that have given energy to the common core, value-added modeling for teacher evaluation, charter schools, and the other forces that are today's education policy makers' palette or armamentarium. Um, we need to go back to that period in order to understand the equity challenges in front of us. And as math people, we know that if we're going to work on a problem, we have to formulate it clearly. And as math people are as want, we need to swaddle ourselves in the numbers and the data, because that's what gives math people direction, strength, and courage. And when we say equity, what was Iris Carl's and NCTM's equity vision of the time? It's worth restating. They were clear that they did not want the accident of where a child lived or particularities of birth to be the principal determinants of a child's mathematics education or for that matter of their educational opportunities. And they believed that if anything were un-American, it should be that these kind of accidents of birth should determine our position in the world. So that's what we want to try to get perspective on, formulate clearly so that we can move forward to that vision. The hot historians will look to 2008 and 2009. It was when the National Governors Association convened an international benchmarking commission. They brought on ACHIEVE, the chief state school officers, with the big behind-the-scenes energy of the Gates Foundation, and they produced a document called Benchmarks for Success. That was really the origin of the Common Core. They brought on David Coleman to essentially write the standards, and rather than NCTM, he brought on his friend Jason Zimba to do the principal writing of the mathematics standards. Right, that was the 2008 period. Let's look at Benchmark for Success and see its analysis of the problem. Then let's look at the data and see how it actually lines up with what we know today. And then let's see where we need to go to really enact the vision of NCTM for equity. Benchmarking for Success had five central principles. Now, you've got to remember this was 2008. It was a painful year massive fiscal crisis, right? The worst since the Depression. There was data coming out from the widget effect that showed in the lowest performing school districts in the United States, 99% of teachers were rated above as average or above average. There were stories from New York of high schools that sent more students to prison than to higher education. It was a period of loss of confidence and it was very much like 1957 when Sputnik came out and people started looking, A, for victims, 
right, for causes, and started looking internationally at what we might learn. This wasn't the first time we tried to benchmark ourselves internationally. The first time was right at the, in World War I, when the President of the United States made an almost identical speech to stuff you'll hear today about worries about Germany and their supremacy. So this is a long tradition of American policymaking, using fear as a driver of change. Too bad they don't know social psychology. What we've learned in social psychology is that fear creates a blip of activity largely followed by a period of denial. They say denial ain't just another river in Egypt for a reason. So the first thing they said was that we need to upgrade state standards by adopting a common core of internationally benchmarked standards in math and language arts so that students compete internationally. As I'll show you, this was driven by one piece of data, PISA, which we're going to look at a little more closely in a few minutes. The second was the classic tradition of blaming the publishers. This reform movement, this populist revolt, had a lot of young entrepreneurs who saw an opportunity to lower the bar to entry into educational publishing and essentially create a more competitive landscape. The third was based on the high performers in PISA, Finland, South Korea, and Singapore, and the idea that they had a very high bar to entry to teaching, whereas the U.S. has a very low bar to entry to teaching. So the notion was, let's focus on teachers as the central driver of reform and rethink how we evaluate teachers. They had the view that teachers are the single most important in-school factor in student achievement, and math people know that that was just an artifact of the way they modeled the problem. Fourth was a statement reaffirming accountability as a driver in testing. And the fifth really came from Governor Sonny Perdue, who noticed that in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, on state tests, almost all their students were proficient, whereas in Massachusetts, a much lower number of students were proficient, even though on NAEP, the students in Alabama and Mississippi were at the bottom of the country in performance, along with California. So there was a desire to benchmark internationally and to recast the system of state control of education, basically looking at a common, not national, but what would effectively be a national standard brought about by coalitions of states. Okay, time to swaddle ourselves in the data. So this was the Sputnik of 2008. It was the release of the 2006 PISA results, and almost all of you will remember this. It showed that we were 25th out of 30 countries, and this led to the idea that we were somewhere near Rwanda and Uganda in mathematics performance. And this was taken as fact. Right? This was the PISA data, and it was used as the main argument for benchmarking even though when we actually went out and read the standards of other countries, it was very hard to do benchmarking because standards play very different roles in different countries. When we read the Finnish standards, they were more about child development than mathematics. But this was politically a very potent tool. At the same time, the TIMS data came out, and there was almost no attention to this at all. It showed that we had come a long way from the 1999 TIMS, and there were only five or six countries that regularly outperformed the U.S. on TIMS, and those were the high-performing Asian countries. In 2011 on, PISA, on TIMS, many of the earlier participants who were low-performing dropped out, and the high-performing countries like New Zealand and Finland participated in TIMS. And still, we were very much near this second cohort from the top. So let's climb into the data and see what we actually know and then what it has to do with equity. In the last TIMS, 
nine states were oversampled so that they participated as countries in effect. Usually it's Texas that likes to think of itself as a separate country, but this time Texas did not participate. Texas did participate as a country in 1999 and did really well, by the way. So green are the highest performing countries on PISA. Not every PISA country participates in TIMS. So Singapore, for example, is there, but other countries were not participating. And what we see is that Massachusetts and Minnesota do extremely well. And when you look at the data more closely, if you look, if you remove black and Hispanic students from the Massachusetts sample, whites and Asians in Massachusetts do as well as Hong Kong. So all of a sudden the argument looked more complicated because as in 1909 when white students in Texas did as well as Japan, and in 2011 when many U.S. states did as well as the high performers, notice that Finland did as well as the U.S. It underperformed significantly Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Indiana, and that some really high performing PISA countries like New Zealand underperformed California, which generally is the bottom of the U.S. performance curve. So this presents a much more complicated picture. And when you look at science, we see the same thing. So if we interpret PISA as saying we should look to those countries for the model of our education, this suggests we should look at Massachusetts rather than Singapore or Finland because we share the same cultural structures and systems. So this data suggests that the analysis that the education policy elites made really is not so clean. I'm now going to show you two graphs that I don't believe anyone in the math community has seen. It's the PISA data disaggregated by child poverty rates. When PISA came out, UNICEF collected child poverty rates on most of the European and OECD countries, but the U.S. didn't report child poverty rates. But lately, the NSF a study panel on income dynamics produced the data you need to compute child poverty rates in the U.S. in the same way the European countries compute them. And when you look at different groups of U.S. students, 10 to 0 to 10 percent free and reduced lunch, they have about a 4 percent child poverty rate. Free and reduced lunch is 130 percent of poverty level. What you see, the yellow dots of the U.S., is that even on PISA, if you control for child poverty, we pretty much are at the top of the world. So the PISA data masks the fact that child poverty rates were the principal factor in performance, not the particular structures of the country's education systems that NGA achieve and the chief state school officers believe were actually the causes of the differences in achievement. And for science, yellow dots are the U.S., different groups by child poverty, and even on PISA, we're extremely high performers. This is amazing because the U.S. educational system has focused mostly on procedural knowledge in its testing, and the high-performing PISA countries have one thing in common. Their frameworks were shaped by the Freudenthal Institute, Finland, New Zealand, when you look at their standards, they're perfectly aligned with PISA. And most kids only learn math that they're taught in school. You don't really learn math on the streets. Although I have to say in my neighborhood in Brooklyn in the mid-1950s, we did learn about quadratic equations and sex on the streets. Quadratic equations and sex was a really heady mix, I'll tell you. So child poverty turns out to be a much better predictor of performance. Now, who learns to apply math? TISA is about applying math in unfamiliar situations. Advantaged kids have opportunities to learn how to use math in the world. Poor kids basically learn math only in school. And that explains this distribution. 
The second big Sputnik event was Americans believed that even though our K-12 system was troubled, they believed that more than was in fact the reality. They believed our higher ed system was clearly the best in the world. And they looked at this data that showed if you look at people 25 to 64, how many people in the audience are older than 64? Notice that they consider us irrelevant to international productivity. <laughs> they sons of bitches, they could have just said 25 and up, right? What is this? So the US was near the top performer. Canada was the highest performer, but that's in part due to their immigration policy, not so much their education system. But when you look at 25 to 34 year olds, the US was in the middle of the pack. It's been known ever since the first Nobel Prize in economics in 1947 to Jan Tinbergen that the proportion of adults with higher education is a principal determinant of international competitiveness. So this really worried the US for good reason. It wasn't that US was falling, was getting worse. It was that other countries were catching up. Now let's look at that data. If you break down baccalaureate attainment by income, 80% of people in the top quartile of income get a baccalaureate degree by age 24 about 11% of people in the bottom quartile of income. So if we're going to work on raising the level of our international competitiveness through education, it's not going to happen by improving the educational outcomes of people in the top quartile of income. Almost all of them are getting baccalaureate degrees. The problem is that almost nobody in the bottom quartiles of income is getting baccalaureate degrees. And again, poverty rates, income rates are the prime determinants of success on these measures. And when we look at race, we can see that 40% of whites, notice that we have been improving as a country in baccalaureate attainment in every ethnic group at impressive rates. The latest data show that 70% of all students who go directly to college earn a, a credential or are still enrolled after six years. We've been on a tremendous rise in completion rates. But still, if we want to rise as a nation, we need to focus on the equity dimensions of the problem. Fewer than a quarter of blacks and about a seventh of Latinos earn baccalaureate degrees by 24. What makes this worse is that about one half of students who go from high school to college are referred to remediation, mostly developmental math, and fewer than a quarter of those students will ever get a credential. Those students are more likely to end up with debt than a credential. In urban areas, in New York City, if you look at the New York City graduates who go to CUNY's community college, 80% of them are placed in remediation, mostly math. In San Francisco, it's greater than 90% of the students. In LA, it's around 80% of the students. Those remedial programs are burial grounds for the aspirations of students. And it's mostly math that's the key trigger. 35,000 students in California two years ago repeated a developmental course for the fifth or greater number of times. So no one can say those students don't have persistence. All right, let's look at our positives. Fourth grade NAEP, broken down by ethnicity. Each line represents a year of learning, a quarter of standard deviation. Massive increases for blacks, Latinos, and whites. But notice that the achievement gap isn't decreasing very much. But if you look horizontally, Notice that black and Latino students now do as well as white students 20 years ago. So it's not about the children, it's what we teach children, what children have an opportunity to learn in school that makes the difference. In some states like Texas, Massachusetts, it's six to eight years difference. Minority students know what white students know six to eight years ago. In other students, in other states, the ranges don't even intersect. 
There's no overlap in the ranges. So states, where you go to school, is a profound influence on what you actually get to know. What else should we be proud of? 2011, 1996, 15 years. Here's 96. 3% of African Americans were proficient, 7% of Latinos, a quarter of whites. Almost three quarters of black fourth graders were below basic, which means basically enumerate. In 15 years, 17% of African Americans, 25% of Latinos, and more than half of whites are proficient, which is a very high bar internationally. Fewer than a th about a third and a quarter of Latinos are below basic. Lots of room to get better, but massive improvement in fourth graders. Any of you who've been around for a while and walked through elementary schools, you can see profound differences in achievement. Eighth grade, very similar. Latinos, statistically African Americans, now we're 20 years behind where whites were. In some states, it's six to eight years. In others, if you project, it would be 40 years. That's how powerful where you live shapes what you learn. And in honor of Iris Carl, let's just climb into this opportunity to learn gap a little more. Eighth grade scores of low-income children, free and reduced lunch. What does this graph show? Remember that each bar is a full year of learning. It means that low-income children in Texas, which is the top of the country, it's really good for Texas to be the top of the country because whenever Texas does something well, everyone else is positive they can do better. <laughs> when Massachusetts is at the top, people go, oh, just Massachusetts. Right. So, but California is right between Alabama and Mississippi in performance. For the California people here, that's not a good thing. 22 years difference in learning according to what state you live in. And when you do more refined controls for poverty level, you get exactly the same distribution. What about high income children? Now Massachusetts is one, Texas is two. California to West Virginia are at the bottom of the country. It's about a year and a half difference for high income children because family is a more important factor in what children learn for high income than for low income. Uh, I won't put them side by side, but now low income children in Massachusetts and Texas perform as well as high income children in West Virginia, Alabama, Hawaii, Louisiana, and so on. That's how big a factor opportunity to learn plays. Remember our NCTM equity commitment is that the accident of where you live should not be the primary shape of your mathematical opportunities. One or two more. Here's a NAEP data. Green does not mean environmentally friendly on this chart, by the way, as you can probably tell by where it's located. Here's the percentage of people who are proficient. In California, 10% of Hispanics are proficient. A quarter of Texas Hispanics are proficient. 20% of Hispanics in Massachusetts. These aren't small differences. These are massive differences in opportunity to learn. And they show up on virtually every test and every indicator. It's not an artifact of NAEP. Is it cities? Maybe one place has more urbanicity. Here's the data when you restrict it to the trial urban district assessments on NAEP. Again, Houston, Austin, and Dallas are at the top of the country. Fresno, District of Columbia, Philadelphia, LA, Cleveland, San Diego are at the bottom. Again, two years, it's actually two and a half years difference in opportunity depending on where you happen to go to school. This is something that as a math teaching profession, we can influence. Poverty is something we need to work on as citizens. Opportunity to learn is something we need to work on as math educators. 
That's a core message for this talk. Now, what about opportunity to learn? This is a graph that's almost, I've never seen this in a mathematics audience before. There's a longitudinal study here of kindergarten children followed all the way through from 1998 to the present. This is what happens to students in the top two quintiles of math achievement. So these are the strongest performing students in the, you know, the top half, the top 40%. The top 40% of African American students in the fifth grade, 35% of them are in eighth grade algebra. 94% of Asians are in eighth grade algebra. That's about local policy. It's something that math teachers need to be concerned about. A new study by the Noyce Foundation, enhanced by WestEd, found that in California, about half of the students, black and Latino students in eighth grade algebra, who pass it are placed in algebra again in the ninth grade, and a third of them do worse the second time they take it. Which is not surprising if you've passed the course with an A and you're told you have to take it again. This is on us. This is not about societal poverty. This is on our community. And the odds that you get a teacher who has a math background differs enormously in the U.S. by what color, with the color of your skin. That falls on us as a community. It's not about national policy and politics and, pol and structure. It's about our choices as teachers and as a profession. One last set. This is the beautiful work of Michael Motter, who's a physicist who studies nonlinear dynamics. So he has beautiful software for making sense of state data sets. The, every, this is Texas. The graphs look very similar everywhere else we've looked. Each circle is a high school. The y-axis is the number of people who meet the minimum SAT college readiness criteria which roughly means you have a 75% chance of getting a C in your first college math course. It's roughly the top half of scores, 58th percentile of scores. Blue is white and Asian. Brown to black is brown to black. <laughs> right? I wonder what Martyr was thinking when he chose these colors. <laughs> The size of the circle is the number of graduates. You can see the scale here. Notice nonlinear, downward sloping phenomena. Low income children on the left, many schools, half the kids are college ready at a minimum level. Look at 80% or more poverty. There's no school where a quarter of the students are college ready. There's been no school last year, the year before, the year before that, or the year before that. So you would think that charters would fix this. Here's all Texas school again, red is charters. Almost all the charters in Texas, this is Texas produced KIPP, Yes Prep, Harmony, IDEA, the strongest national charters. Almost all the charters produce 0% of students who are college ready. There are a few of them, one KIPP, one Yes Prep, one IDEA, one Harmony, that are pretty good. Most of them are well below the public schools. So this theory of achieve NGA, CCSSO, race to the top, that charters were the answer, not so clear when you actually climb into the numbers. The reverse looks true. Here's African Americans. The red are the charters. All the other circles are public schools. You can see it's still downward slope where poverty level is the biggest determinant of success. And here's Hispanics. The top red dot is IDEA, a wonderful single charter school. Right? This is the data. Now, most of you are in schools, in your own school every day. 
I have the rare privilege of being in lots of different schools around the country. I'm in schools that serve the poorest children all the time. I was privileged to serve as chair of the New York City math panel and have worked with people in several large urban districts looking at their schools. When you visit most math classrooms, it's like you're in a Kafkaesque universe of these degraded social worlds where children are filling in bubbles rather than connecting the dots. It's driven by a compliance mentality on tests that are neither worthy of the children nor worthy of the discipline they purport to reflect. That is the reality. That's something that we as math educators can control. Campbell's Law in social policy says that the more that any social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. High stakes assessment produces compulsive focus on narrow parts of schooling. The original data for Campbell wasn't about schooling, by the way. It was about crime statistics. Around 1970s, they started evaluating police departments based on their crime closure rates. And what did they learn that's relevant to our situation in education? They learned first that when they caught a burglar, when crime statistics measured police effectiveness, Burglars started confessing to large numbers of crimes they didn't commit. And their sentences went down the more crimes they actually confessed to because police needed to close cases in order to be rated highly. Uh, rape cases were vastly underreported because they were almost never closed. It became much harder for women to report rape because the indicators actually drove the behavior of police departments in the same way these indicators are disproportionately affecting the schools that poor children attend to. I get the power of high stakes accountability. It's a blunt instrument wielded from a great distance. But we as a math education community need to remember the children in our care come first and we have to moderate the effects. This is the hardest challenge for our profession. Now what's really, it's, so what this shows is that the current theory about school improvement, that charters, common core, right, value-added measures of teaching are going to solve the problem is profoundly wrong. That doesn't mean we can't use the common core powerfully to reboot our systems, but it's not the solution to the basic problems of schooling. And there's a beautiful story about how Boeing became the, leading, uh, the leader in international transport. And it's worth a minute to tell it because it talks about the importance of having the right theory of failure. And this is a story to which I am indebted to my colleague Michael Martyr. After World War II, Great Britain was about to regain, have supremacy in international air flights. They had the beautiful de Havilland Comet, this beautiful plane with recessed engines in the wing, a marvel to look at, quiet, and they flew from London to the far reaches of the empire until a plane dropped out of the sky. And they studied it, they attributed it to pilot error, and they worked on training pilots. Next year, two planes fell out of the sky, one over Canada, one over Africa, and they attributed it to metal fatigue. And the de Havilland Comet engineers said, let's look at the pieces and perfect each one. At the same time, Boeing, which was a little military contractor in Seattle, hired a graduate student named Paul Farris, who worked with George Irwin at the Naval Research Institute. And he had a radically different theory of failure. He said, flying is a bitch. It's like really, really hard. And you can never predict where the failure will erupt. So you need to build fault tolerant systems with planned redundancy. And they designed the Boeing 707 to be fault tolerant, knowing they could never predict where flight would cause a problem. They made a famous video 
where they put a de Havilland comet in a wind chamber, they dropped the guillotine on its nose and it exploded. Then they put a Boeing 707 in the wind chamber, they dropped a guillotine on it and it absorbed the guillotine without exploding. That was the end of British supremacy in air transport. Guess what? Poverty really sucks. It's incredibly hard. All the lifespan studies going back to the 1920s Paul, that uh, Glenn Elders has written about show that poverty in youth is a very hard force. We need to build fault-tolerant schools and systems if we're actually going to address equity. Just think about it. The great majority of our children finish our schools positive that there are a whole list of things they're not. They come out of schooling believing they're not mathematical, they're not artistic, they're not philosophical, they're not athletic. And these self-imposed beliefs undermine your sense of personal freedom, the font from which all freedoms come. If we are really going to address our problems of poverty, it's not the common core, although we can use it well if we subvert it and take control over it. Got to remember that when the common core was created, they didn't come to NCTM. They got David Coleman to write it and he brought his friend Jason Zimber to do the math. They did not come to NCTM. It's time for us now, the professional societies, to talk about what standards should be and how to reshape the Common Core so that it reflects our best practice knowledge of schooling. Hard message, but a necessary message. Now, so what's really at stake here? Beautiful little graph. This is a graph that shows where the jobs are in the U.S. When you look in the right on the left, skill percentile. This is the rough measure of the skills, you, the skills involved in a job. What's happening in America is a big proportionate increase in zero-skill jobs. Working in fast food restaurants, service delivery jobs, and a big increase in high-skill jobs and an actual decrease in middle-skill jobs. Here are the wages. This doesn't mean that low-skill jobs have high wages. This is the proportionate increase over 20 years. So very low-income jobs have a slight increase, which is big proportionately. High-skill jobs have a massive increase. Low-skill to middle-skill jobs are flat in income. What is the determinant of whether you have a high-skill job in the U.S.? Overwhelmingly, it's mathematics. It's the single biggest factor in upward social and economic mobility. It's our beloved subject. It would be wonderful if it were music instead of math. Think how great the country would be if everyone was striving to learn to play an instrument instead of factor quadratic equations. But the fact is, it is our discipline that's the primary determinant. We used to believe in America that it was easy for a poor child to get stronger and have a better life by education and hard work. This is elasticity of intergenerational income. 0.5 means that if, you earn 10, if your father earns $10,000 less than average, half of that is passed on to their children. The U.S. has the second worst rating. The likelihood that you can improve your life through education and hard work in the U.S. is now lower than France. That's like Old Testament bad. Rivers of blood, frogs, locusts. <laughs> the idea that it's no longer true in America that you can advance through education and hard work is the major threat we face as a country. Why is that? because democracy is built on a social contract. And that social contract says precisely that income inequality is okay if you or your children can have a better life through effort. We need to rebuild our education systems so that they allow students to advance. Education is not the whole part of it. There's also the structure of the economy, but education is the part that we control. So I send you forth from this talk with a message of strength and courage. 
There are two factors that shape inequality in this country and educational achievement inequality. The big one is poverty, but a really big one is opportunity to learn. As citizens, we need to work on poverty and income inequality or our democracy is threatened. As mathematics educators, and to realize the image of Iris Call and all the great NCTM leaders of that time, we need to work on opportunity to learn. It cannot be that the accident of where a child lives or particulars of their birth determine their mathematics education. And why are we particularly important? Because our beloved field is the principal determinant of whether people will end up on the right hand of their job skills curve rather than the left end. Thank you. So, Linda's asked me to take questions, but being a classroom teacher like you are, I know that it's a bad idea unless you give people a minute to talk with their neighbors about what question they want to ask. So, that means talk with your neighbor if you have a question and formulate a question you want to ask. And as teacher, I'll feel free to call on anyone in the audience who I don't see talking. <laughs> Go to it. Yes. Thank you. It's the best presentation I've been to. Every single one of your books. Uh, this was very, very helpful. Um, I have two questions and they're loaded. One is I don't disagree with you about the JC that I've done before. I thought that was an interesting thing that we went around us. But what would you propose differently? And secondly, how closely are we working with groups to help with the poverty situation? Because just in education 24 years, I have always felt it was the poverty that was the issue, not the race, not even the zip code. It was the poverty of the child that impacted how focused it could be in my class. So the second first. It turns out that poverty is a major determinant, but it's still the case that race matters in this society. And you can, when you look at the data, you could see even when you control for poverty that race remains a central factor. We've come to a point where people want to make this a post-racial society. It's our common dream, but the reality is the reality and the numbers are the numbers. And by the way on that, one of the unfortunate consequences of the current reform is that it's taken the eye off not only poverty, but one of the central roles of schooling in a diverse society. And that is of schools as places where we produce citizens with deep commitments to democratic ideals. In the 1920s, our schools were places that forged an American identity despite enormous diversity. And we need to return our schools to engines of producing a complex American identity with commitment to the things that make us a country, which are ideas, not blood. The Common Core is at a very critical juncture. Last week, the National Republican Convention took a vote of no confidence in the Common Core. And many people have raised concerns about Park and Smarter Balance's ability to thrive in the face of the College Board and ACT's campaign to control the essential assessment market. We, as the math teaching profession, need to assert our beliefs and our theories about what children should learn and how should they learn it. But I will say, as someone who's been involved in writing state standards, there's a lot of beautiful stuff in the Common Core. The practice standards are exquisite. Some of the learning progressions are beautiful, and I think they're genuine advances. So as we actually go out and think about our role, Let's start with the Common Core, make it work, refine it, and look as Zalo Sishkin has said, let's look to the next iteration of it and assert our role in determining what that should be. But if the Common Core collapses, it's going to be a bad thing. If we do not take responsibility for it, it will be a worse thing. 
Other questions? Thank you. I'm Dr. Cheryl Young. I'm a product of the CUNY education system. Yes. I have a PhD in geology, and I come from a poverty background. Yes. I have um, taught in inner city schools, and presently I teach on the Native American reservation in Washington State. And the question that I pose to you, I believe in equity and education for all students, irregardless of race or socioeconomic level. The question that I have for you is, I know I'm in a unique situation to make a difference, and I question my role in this unique situation. Um, I'm a geologist, but I have chosen to um, direct my attention to mathematics because I understand how important it is. I work with teacher preparation um, around science and math content and pedagogy. And so I'm in a rural uh, situation. How do I impact the lives and, and the belief systems of my teachers and my students? I, I see that yeah. I do a power of work, and I know that you will be very blunt say what that role is. Yes. So this is a, just a wonderful question. <laughs> Thank you so much. As individual teachers, we have extraordinary power to shape the lives of the children in our classrooms. One of my teachers, Jack Stutzman, told me that one of the great wonders of teaching is that even on a crappy day, you can do something extraordinarily wonderful for a particular student. So we as teachers can build the skills to shape lives. But unless we work also as a collective, as a profession, we will not have the aggregate effect we want. That's why NCTM, NCSM, ASSM, and our professional organizations have to play a role. The current reform rhetoric says that it's individual teachers in their classrooms that really matter most, and the actual data shows that it's school and district culture that matters most. Tony Brike's work of exquisite methodological clarity and rigor shows that practices get turned into student achievement only in the face of relational trust in communities and schools. So we need to work as individuals, to nurture the abilities of our children, and we need to work as a collective to have a common voice in shaping perforce on American education. But the rest of that question deserves a good glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's one more question we can... It looks like it's yours. Make it a good one. Well, I have to. Okay. Not to put the pressure on you there. Um, so one of the questions, if you take two cohorts of students that are at the same poverty level and even isolating or for the race variable, like the same distribution of race, and they're in different states, and you talk about the opportunity to learn, what are some of the general factors that are causing one of those cohorts to have a better opportunity than the other? So let's look at, let's look at California and Texas, for example. In California in the 1980s, in, in Texas in the 1980s, when Mark White was governor, he mobilized a business coalition led by Ross Perot before he went crazy, right? <laughs> and his exquisite attorney, Tom Luce, who's really a hero in Texas education. And they got the moderate business community to construct a strategic plan for Texas. And they sat the legislature, the legislature was a machine for resolving short-term competing interests. The business community really called the shots, and they created a coherent plan. In that structure, Kathy Seeley, Susan Hull, Iris Carl, when she was a regional math director in Houston, put together an extraordinary system for supporting teachers, text teams. There was a coherence of math education. There were common standards. There was accountability that focused on black and Latino students' achievement, first in Texas before anywhere else. That's what allowed the development of an infrastructure 
so that when Susan Hull, Kathy Seely, and I got to manage the standards creation process, we were able to construct a coherent statewide center for teacher professional development, very parallel to what happened in Massachusetts. In California, the business community never could get its act together, so everything was left to a romantic image of teachers as individual saviors. The image there is that individual teachers are sort of the composers of their own curriculum. A lot of the professional development was around elite strategies. There wasn't coherent school-based professional development and regional professional development. Big differences in the feel of how it worked. Those were big, big factors. But the first thing was the policy environment. The policy environment in the high-performing states allowed the math community to put place structures, rituals, and routines for developing math educators. That's the key determinant. So this is what's so tricky, because we need to work on this as citizens and as math education professionals. Both are actually required. We could not have done what we did at the Dana Center in Texas if the policymakers didn't have their act together. Right? It requires both. I hope this talk was useful to you and that you'll take the positive pieces of it and go forward with strength and courage and hopefully a little image of the little wiry, tough, fierce Iris Carl in your head. Thank you.